Welcome back and thank you for staying with us. We really appreciate your time. In case you're just joining us, this is News Check, a program that seeks to explore issues shaping the news and conversations in the country. And what we do here, we usually bring in experts in studio to break down some of these issues for you and to give you useful insights on how they can better your life and how you can make better decisions. So today we want to talk about reproductive health rights for the second hour of our program. And when you talk about sexual and uh, reproductive health is a fundamental human right as well as a human development issue that states are obligated to fulfill. We have international and local human rights instruments such as the constitution that has actually gone a step ahead to ensure that uh, some of these rights are enshrined in it. But we still face a lot of challenges in implementation of uh, some of the provisions in these uh, human rights instruments, both locally and even internationally. So here in our country, what we have seen is lack of awareness, lack of goodwill, lack of that intentional effort to uh, make sure that uh, some of these rights are, are fulfilled. And we want to talk about what the law says when it comes to reproductive health, but we will also be focusing on the problem that we are currently facing as our country, that's the surge in teenage pregnancies, and look at the best approach to addressing this issue, both before, during, and after. So how do we safeguard our population, our young population? That is the question we are asking this morning. So allow me to introduce my guests for this conversation. I'll start with uh, the gentleman, the only gentleman on the panel. <laughs> His name is Martin Olo. Martin is an advocate of the High Court and also serves as the senior legal advisor at the Center for Reproductive Rights. And of course, Martin is serving in this capacity as a public interest litigator, human rights and democracy defender, and international criminal law expert, as well as a public policy and advocacy consultant. And I can go on and on about his rich profile. But allow me to stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very time. much. And just as a matter of correction, it's Martin Onyango. Martin Onyango. <laughs> yes, I yeah. know I have a name set <laughs> called Lolo who also appears. Thank you for that, yes. Martin Onyango. Thank you. All right, and we have uh, Dr. Judith Olo. That's where the confusion came. Mm -hmm. <laughs> An expert in human rights law. She's the chief executive officer at the Center, uh, East African Center for Human Rights. If you like, you can call it Each Rights. And uh, she, at the time of her appointment, she was serving as a lecturer at Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology and headed uh, the Department of Public Law. She has also worked at uh, the Catholic University of East Africa uh, as a lecturer and also as a head of Department of uh, Private Law. Uh, she's also an advocate of the High Court and very passionate about human rights, child rights and also the girl child. Thank you for creating time for us. Thank you for having me. All right, so we want to start this conversation straight away and there's uh, a current crisis that we are facing as a country, especially in this COVID-19 pandemic. Some say it was there, that COVID-19 just gave us an opportunity to look at it and highlight it. That's the teenage pregnancy menace. Um, some say COVID-19 actually played a role to escalate the cases of teenage pregnancy. I'd just like to begin from a general comment from both of you. Um, you know, where do you stand in this argument? Is it COVID or is it a problem that you have always been having as a society? I'll start with you, Dr. Olo. Um. Thank you very much, Safin. Uh, from where I stand, I think it is a problem that has always been there, but then uh, COVID-19 situation escalated it because it is at that time that we saw that schools were closed and uh, children were spending a lot of time at home. And to a very large extent, we realized that schools are a very good mechanism for protecting children. But now that children were at large, they were open to lots and lots of violations. And that is the reason why we saw a serious upsurge in cases of teenage pregnancies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your opening remarks as well, Martin. Yes, thank you, Selfie. I think teenage pregnancy has been here with us. And as Dr. Law has said, COVID made the situation worse uh, by reducing the protection normally available to children, to young people in other fora, including uh, schools. So uh, I, I concur that actually COVID just made uh, the situation worse, but uh, teen pregnancies is a challenge uh, we've been grappling with uh, as a country. 
and we need to do more uh, to protect uh, our children. Mm -hmm. yes. Indeed, and we'll talk about how do we address this problem before we wind up this program. And I know you have very beautiful interventions that you will share with us that we may borrow from as a country, what even your organizations have been part of. But before that, I will not take our viewers this morning on the numbers of teenage pregnancy. I'm sure we have been taken through that over time. Something that stood out for me when I was preparing for the show was... Um, when I looked at the Kenya Demographic Health Survey of 2014, the latest that we have, it's years back, but unfortunately it's that's the, most the latest. that you can refer to, <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> And what I was looking for is the median age at first sexual intercourse because the concern has been, are we burying our heads in the sand when we are saying the youth should not be exposed to comprehensive sexual education, we should not be talking about this. So that has been a concern. So I went back to look at what is the median age of first sexual intercourse in Kenya. And when I looked at what the uh, survey was uh, giving us, 18 years for women, 17 years for men. And if you compare that with the previous one uh, that was done in uh, 2008, 2009, there is no much difference. The median age was 18.2 years for women and 17.64 for, for men. I understand currently the Kenya Bureau of Statistics uh, is uh, doing another one yes. that will be out very soon. Are you foreseeing a scenario where the trend will change or it is time for us to actually stop burying our heads in the sand and address uh, this particular issue, Dr. Olo. Um, thank you, Sarfin. Um, from where I sit also, I think that uh, the number of, um, rather the median age of children having sex is really much lower. It's getting lower. L lower and lower uh -huh. to really uh, pathetic levels, quote unquote. Because uh, from what we see in the media, we now see that uh, even nine-year-olds, 11-year-olds, mm -hmm. we see that they are pregnant. And of course, for that to happen, some, some activity must have happened in the background. So having gotten pregnant is just one thing, but a lot of them are actually having, this, uh, having sexual intercourse at a very young age. And uh, that's why we have large numbers of them also um, dying, unfortunately, during childbirth. And that's why the number of mortality rates is really go going high when it comes to women and also complications that arise as a result of, of childbirth. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of uh, children having sex and it is necessary to actually have this conversation. We can no longer afford to uh, bury our, our heads in the sand because it's really going to get worse. Our children are our future. And if we are to help them, if we love them at all, then this discussion is something that we need to bring to the mm -hmm. table. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I know, Martin, you work with mm -hmm. an organization that has championed um, uh, such rights, championing uh, these rights. And um, borrowing from that experience, where did we miss it? You know, where did we go wrong? Why are we suddenly in this particular quagmire? Thank you. Uh, I think I will start from where you started. I'm not concerned more about the median age because the median age just looks at what is the upper and the lower age and divides it into two. Uh -huh. But I'm more concerned about uh, when the sexual debut starts. I'm, I would be more concerned about the few who actually have their first sexual debut when they're below 10 and ask ourselves how are we protecting them because by the time you get to 18 you have millions and millions of children who have had their first sexual debut and uh, the problem is that uh, children and i would and when you use the term children i know some viewers are looking at a three-year-old mm -hmm. but you know a child is from zero to uh, 18 years i am more concerned about the adolescent who has reached puberty mm -hmm. is engaging in sex and where did the rain start beating us yeah. is that uh, one we've encouraged and we really encourage all children to get formal education and we said schools are a protective uh, mechanism uh, for development and also protecting children but what we have denied children in these institutions is also to learn about their development as people as male as female so that children then start sexual debut without information we do not even tell them that actually at this tender age you are not prepared, you are not ready to engage uh, or to deal with consequences of a sexual intercourse. And if you must engage in sexual intercourse, this is what you need to do so that you are not in danger. We have denied children that chance 
to get that information mm. through denying them what we call comprehensive sexuality education. Unfortunately, we are denying them this chance in schools, but out, and out of schools, there is no mechanism, there is no framework, again, to provide them with this information. And you know when sexual debut begins, for boys and for girls, health services that are required to help the children, to help the adolescents, enjoy or grow uh, as um, responsible uh, young people into responsible adults. The health services, we also unfortunately deny them the health services. We deny information, we deny them health services. So we then now so deny, 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 deny. <laughs> and we also deny ourselves the fact that these children or these adolescents are having sex. So it is a dark environment where we deny the children information, we deny them services, and we also deny that they are having sex up to the point that they are expectant. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is where we, the rain started beating us. Uh, denial of information and denial of services to young people and refusing to accept that actually young people, they are human beings and they are developing and they are also engaging, for example, in sexual uh, uh, intercourse, whether mm -hmm. experimental or, for example, uh, there are some uh, mature minors who are engaging, for example, in commercial sex. Mm -hmm. We have just denied that this, this exists. And it is a problem and it's becoming really thorny and we are seeing the results, we are seeing the consequences out here already. No wonder we are having this conversation. Dr. Olo, I mean, uh, for those who feel that comprehensive sexuality education is not warranted, especially for the young population. They've raised concerns of this will expose the young minds to information that is not meant for their age, that this will open loopholes for them to just get out there and engage in whatever sort of activities that they want to engage in. Concerns such as those, how do you address it? And the if that Martin also raised, that don't engage in sex, but if you do, this is what you need to do to protect yourself. There are people who are still reserved about the if. How do you address those concerns? Thank you so much for that question. I was about to jump in when, when Martin was still <laughs> <laughs> making his point. Yeah. Um, uh, I think the biggest misconception there is about uh, comprehensive sexual edu sexuality education is that uh, children are being given information that they're, that they're not supposed to have. But if we go back behind uh, our history, we realize that even in the, um, in the 50s, in the 60s, our parents went to their aunties and to their uncles to be taught something like this. But our children now, we are busy, we go to work in the morning, we come back in the evening. There's no time to really engage. And so uh, comprehensive sh uh, sexuality education is actually very necessary because someone has to talk about this thing. We can, we can no longer um, continue to hide because at the end of the day, even if we do not want to accept it, we realize that children are having sex and it is best that they have the information that they need if they're going to engage in that because we want to protect them and and this is not this is not a whole scale or a wholesale um, opening of a Pandora's box to allow children to have sex I think that is the misconception mm -hmm. we are saying you need this information you are developing you're a girl this and these changes are happening to you you are a boy this and these changes are happening to you so sex, sexuality education is not it's not just about the sex itself but understanding your body understanding what is happening to you and being able to relate with other people experiencing the same thing and realizing that it is nothing well it is something unique teenagehood is something you can enjoy but it is it, it, you are better off enjoying or you better off understand how to live your life when you have all the information and you are expecting certain things to happen to you mm. but when you don't then these things happen and you are in shock and you confide in your young in, in your people of your age who do, who also do not know much they're in the same train with you. And this is what leads to lies and lies or misconceptions over misconceptions. And children now have their own gangs against the parents where if they want information about sex, they, they tell their friends. If they want information about a certain boy they like or don't like, they tell their friends. But they will never tell the parent that, hey, this and this guy is hitting on me or this and this mm -hmm. guy beat me up or this and this guy touched me inappropriately. But if we are going to have a comprehensive sexuality education, then we are going to tell them this is the information and these are the limits. Mm. This is how to even report in case you feel violated. Mm. But this is the thing that we are denying our children. Who should do this? 
in a society <laughs> that that is a taboo topic you don't discuss it with your son or daughter so i mean how do we go about it whose mandate is it to offer this sort of education thanks Selvin. and i think uh, where we are now we are now talking about uh, when now uh, what you'd say are traditional norms when they fail when the setup does not then offer the information and services uh, to uh, the adolescent who should take this up and that is where the responsibility of the state comes in the government has a responsibility one to ensure that everybody has the information that will enable them enjoy the highest attainable standard of health because uh, your sexuality uh, your reproductive uh, health is part of your right to health mm. so the government has a responsibility to provide that information to everybody not to adults of course adults uh, it's a funny situation where adults think that it is they are the only ones who are entitled to rights human rights belong to everyone children adolescents adults old people they all have equal rights mm. so the government has a responsibility to provide this information so that where parents fail where uh, societies fail to provide the alternative fora for informing young people the government then has the responsibility to ensure that they have in this information and where is the forum that the government can do this and that is why there has always been a clamor that can we teach comprehensive sexuality education in schools in schools okay yes. that's one of the yes so um, that is one of the avenues but also government has a responsibility then to provide the safety net the protection framework that those who do not have this information information in schools can they find it out of schools those who cannot access services can they access these services even if they're not out of school because we cannot assume every young person is, is in school there are also young people who are out of school and that is where now we talk about information and services whether those who are still in whether you are still in school or you are out of school all right I, I just want us because we are both legal minds and I want to uh, you know just take advantage of that and talk about how the reproductive health rights are uh, addressed in the uh, you know legal and policy framework in this country you know when you talk about rights um, people are comfortable when you're talking about right to vote, right to freedom of speech, freedom of worship. But when you're talking about uh, reproductive health rights and the young population, it's, it's like people are divided into two, especially on some issues that the law addresses. I just want to first of all begin by just giving you a chance to tell me how the reproductive health rights that touch on the young people are addressed in the, Nash, in the legal and policy frameworks in this country. Uh, let me begin, begin with you, Dr. Olo. Thank you. What laws or policies touch on these issues? Um, there's the Constitution of Kenya that uh, provides for right to health in general. And um, of course, uh, lots of areas of right to health are taken care of. There's maternal, maternal health, psychological health, and all manner of health, including uh, sexual and reproductive health rights. It's only that um, a lot of focus when it comes to that is given to adults, mm -hmm. uh, people who are in a marriage setting, marriage arrangement, talking about right to have children and how many, to, how many of them within what specific period of time. But then when it comes to children, like Martin was saying earlier, we just refuse to accept that so, children are so having sex. Do they apply to young people? They I want you do. to give me laws and policies yes. in the context of the young people. <laughs> yes, so constitution yeah. applies to everyone, yeah. including young people. Uh, so right to, the constitution provides for right to health. Uh, we also have the, the um, Health Act. Um, the National Health Act that provides for everyone to be entitled to the best health that there is and that includes children as well. I'm sure there are a number, a number of policies um, in, uh, that Martin would you like to speak about mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. when it comes to the policy level, which policies have been put in place to just support um, sexual and reproductive health rights in terms of what facilities are available to children, child-friendly uh, services for example where they can get uh, advice regarding contraceptive where they can get the actual contraceptive should they need it um, and also now the issue that uh, led of course to the case uh, that is there 
publicly about abortion services if it is necessary because of course by children having sex uh, pregnancy is a natural consequence and so um, are we availing uh, the services the law is saying that that's, such services are available mm. only that when it comes to interpreting their availability for children then we sort our, our personal biases our religious values our personal values come in and we sort of just say reject or deny mm. yes. the, the, do those pieces of legislation apply as an umbrella like you know cutting across all generations the adults and the young children especially when you're talking about contraceptives availability of such services for example there are people who are a bit still skeptical about uh, that uh, thank you Serfin uh, besides uh, what uh, Dr. Law has said that applies to everyone, I think the government in 2015, the Ministry of Health made deliberate efforts to address the needs of adolescents when it comes to accessing reproductive health care. Hence the uh, um, adolescent uh, sexual reproductive health policy of 2015 that uh, aimed to address um, the challenges or uh, the the gaps that existed especially from uh, service provision perspective where some people felt that oh I need to ask your mother whether to give you a condom or uh, whether to put you on uh, a contraceptive mm -hmm. and that policy clearly calls on the need to provide uh, adolescents not just with information but also to provide uh, services. The implementation framework of that policy uh, requires the provision of youth-friendly services, hence the creation of even youth-friendly uh, centers where young people can go and find services offered that are friendly to them where uh, for example uh, you are not uh, asked about your age but let us not forget that uh, the issues that are thorny are very few it is on contraceptives for young people it is on access to abortion care for young people mm -hmm. and adults it is on uh, providing comprehensive information to young people which is uh, opposed to, uh, by some people but generally accepted because even in churches one of the uh, basic information that we tell young people is if you're not ready uh, to deal with the consequence of sexual intercourse please abstain i'm sure all many churches uh, preach abstinence for example mm -hmm. so the information is available unfortunately the universality of that information is lacking people select what to tell young people they deny them the wholesomeness of the information but then when it comes to contraceptives uh, for example a young person a young lady, a young girl, uh, 16 year old who is pregnant and uh, wants to keep that pregnancy and has gone to for antenatal care, they are treated like an adult who is uh, expectant and they are given all the information and even after birth they are put on the contraceptive mm -hmm. when they so wish. Mm -hmm. But the young person who wants uh, to avoid uh, a pregnancy is denied that information and some people have a challenge in providing them uh, with a contraceptive mm -hmm. and that is what the gap the policy aimed to address what challenge do we see there are people who are uncomfortable with implementing that, that not just service providers but there are also policy makers who speak contrary to government policy mm -hmm. when the constitution says we all have access to health and uh, as a right and reproductive health care services it simply means those who need those services cannot face barriers unnecessary barriers to access those services that you cannot bring your personal bias you may not like the fact that a 16 year old is having sex but if a 16 year old boy comes to a shop to buy condoms He's entitled to buy those condoms because he acknowledges but, but, that but, sex but without we, condoms, he we, may get HIV. How do we address that very loud concern on the other side of the divide? Because, um, you know, should we then say that the law and these policies clash with the tradition, clash with the cultural <laughs> values, clash with the religious values? Can we afford to ignore those concerns, Dr. Olo? Not necessarily. Yeah. Um, how, how do we reach like a <clears throat> middle ground? I think uh, awareness creation and having open conversation is one of the ways to bring uh, the opposite ends to, to actually meet. Um, like I said earlier, uh, children 
are having sex and we see consequences of that a lot of children are having children currently mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. some of them are out of school some of them are back to school and we want to ensure that we have the best that is possible for our children but then um saying some some of our cultures are, are also retrogressive not all of them but mm -hmm. most of our cultures are retrogressive so let us speak those cultural values that helps us to to move forward like those ones that allow us to talk to our children those cultures that can actually speak to their children though that is almost unexistent these days where parents sit down to speak to children but then um, legislations are a reflection of what is happening in the society. Actually, legislations are a cure to social problems, and therefore, for us to have a law in place that protects those, those children and articulates that they need or they should be guaranteed this a, service A, B, C, D, it means that legislators have looked into the issue and are convinced that that is the way to cure the problem. Mm. And as such, we should be able to embrace the law because the laws are passed for the good of us. Mm. Yes. Mm. We are all from different communities. Some communities can talk about sex, others may cannot, not. I, I understand that people in the coastal area are more free or, or more mm. uh, talking about sex, but other parts of the country may not be. Yeah, and, and that is perfectly fine. But when it comes to the law, the law has a uniform application. We will not pick and choose which communities to apply, which religious values to apply. We should embrace the law as it is because it is good for us. Mm. Yes. Mm. I, I, just, I just want us, I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later, but just before we go so deep into this conversation, there's something that uh, Martin yes. brought out about, um, you know, uh, the law that touches on provision of abortion care services that actually recently um, there was a, uh, uh, what was called a landmark ruling in Malindi by the Malindi High Court concerning a case that involved a minor aged 16 uh, from Kilifi County. I just want you to give us a bit of background on this particular case and then I'll raise some issues of concern that, that, that those who are anti um, that particular constitutional provision have raised so that at least we can get clarity on what's the way forward, what's the best way to implement this piece of legislation. But first, let's, let's begin from the genesis. <laughs> Thank you very yes. much. And I want to contextualize uh, this conversation uh, from the point that uh, sexual violence or defilement of uh, children is here with us. Traditionally, we didn't, uh, children were protected from sexual predation. That has ceased, so the law has come in to protect children. So when you uh, have a sexual uh, intercourse as an adult with a, a child, it is called defilement, mm. and uh, you need to be uh, prosecuted and taken to jail. And uh, the consequences of dealing with consequences of sexual violence, what we had provided in law from the year 2006 in the Sexual Offenses Act is that when a child is defiled, Part of the remedy that is available to them is not to force them to carry the pregnancy if they don't wish, is to allow them to terminate that pregnancy. That is 2006 in the Sexual Offences Act, before we even uh, passed our new constitution. And the Ministry of Health developed uh, guidelines uh, for management of sexual violence, which clearly provided that uh, for survivors of defilement, they need to be informed that... Uh, if they wish, they can terminate the pregnancy and the health provider is required to offer that service to them with dignity. The case we are talking about depicts a problem we have in our society. That uh, one, healthcare providers providing reproductive healthcare, abortion and contraceptives, a contraceptive to young people and abortion to everyone are always targeted by law enforcement agency for extortion, for arrest, and for prosecution, quote unquote, for providing abortion. Assuming blanketly that abortion is not allowed in law. But the problem gets bigger when a child is defiled, the law allows this child to access abortion, but when this child goes to the provider, the police arrest the provider and arrest the child and take them to court and treat them as criminals. The tendency has been that patients are arrested from the clinics where they are seeking care. So the police just wait for a tip-off or set a trap, arrest the patient and arrest the provider.
So that is the background to the Malindi case. This was a case of a young school girl who was defiled and for her she lost the pregnancy. She was experiencing bleeding <coughs> and when she went to the facility the clinical officer noted that she had lost the pregnancy and so the clinical officer provided what we call post-abortion care. But the police pounced on the clinic, arrested the girl and arrested the clinical officer and charged them with uh, providing and seeking abortion care. And they were, the, the, the young girl was kept in remand for about one month, taken away from the hospital bed, denied a chance to go to school, kept in remand for over one month, harassed, intimidated, not allowed even to finish her medication at the hospital. So this is the case that then, uh, as the Center for Reproductive Rights, took to court, challenging that one, abortion is allowed under certain circumstances in our law. Mm -hmm. Two, w which circumstances are this? Because I just want us to use this Our platform. constitution yeah. allows abortion, one, in emergency situations or when the health of the woman is in danger, mm -hmm. or when the life of the woman is in danger, or when allowed by any other written law. And there you now reference uh, the Sexual Offenses Act mm -hmm. for survivors of rape and defilement. <coughs> so that while we have uh, the criminal uh, law, the penal code, yeah. that defines what is wrong in our law, it cannot therefore define what is allowed by the constitution as a wrong. What is allowed by the constitution is protected so that access to abortion for that category of people and uh, under those circumstances you cannot then prosecute anybody uh, for doing uh, quote unquote something unlawful because it is sanctioned by the constitution. So the circumstances that this young girl and the provider found themselves was that the police pounced on them and charged the young girl and the provider for seeking a reproductive health care service allowed in law. But here were the policemen charging them for doing something unlawful. Mm -hmm. And they protested before court that no, she came for... Uh, It's very clear that it's enshrined in the law, like, like you cite, but under what circumstances and, or, or, or what is it that will help us address the grey areas in this? Because how do we set like, a concrete um, boundary to know that this is exclusively a case of defilement or this person is under threat or risk or this pregnancy is high risk without you know, the loopholes that ab can be abused by some people who just want to use that piece of legislation to get rid of pregnancies that they do not necessarily feel like they want to carry. They, they are not at any point in any health risk or they were not defiled, but they just want to use that piece of legislation as a loophole to you know, procure an abortion. How do we safeguard against? Those are the concerns that uh, those who are anti this piece of legislation are raising. Mm. Uh, Dr. Law, maybe you can respond to that. Okay, can I start? Mm. Yes, I think Dr. Law can respond <laughs> yeah. and then I will... Uh, you can add. Yeah, I yes. think one of the assumptions around um, laws regarding or laws that protect sexual and reproductive health rights is that um, they are prone to abuse. That is the assumption. Yeah. I think at the point that someone determines that uh, they want, they would like to procure an abortion, it is really a very important issue and it's not like when laws are passed that guarantee or that protect the right to have an abortion under certain circumstances, then it is 
a whole scale sort of it is open for all and it is open for abuse mm -hmm. no mm -hmm. um one of the things that needs to be done is awareness creation and awareness creation should be done for all the population so that even those who condemn they must first understand that this has to be done within certain circumstances yeah i think that in itself will remove the dark cloud for lack of a better word or mm. the obscenity or the um, taboo around the issue of abortion because in certain cases abortion is the lifesaver when you are having an ectopic pregnancy for example you should terminate it as soon as possible and therefore you're able to save your life and in certain cases maybe the life of the child i'm not sure mm -hmm. but then it is necessary it is not an issue of you deciding to choose but then come to look at the other side whereby because we have made this taboo this topic such a taboo you find that girls are still trying to procure abortion anyway yeah unfortunately they're doing it back street just this morning when i was preparing for this show i read some um report from Am amnesty international saying that up to 26000 um girls get incapacitated every year because of ha trying to procure abortion by themselves and then they go to the hospital when things have really gone bad so can we prevent this situation from happening by clearly pointing out that abortion yes is allowed but within these circumstances this is what you need to do information is free we should make it available to mm -hmm. everyone but then the right information through capacity building through um just informing everyone about what they need to know concerning abortion all right i still want to <laughs> take you back but let yes. me also get uh, your sentiments martin thanks uh, i think uh, to add to that uh, one of the assumptions we make is that uh, we put ourselves in the shoes of uh, the people the constitution has, has uh, termed as trained health professionals. The decision uh, or the provision of health care is not for any Tom, Dick and Harry. Mm -hmm. It's not even for policemen. And that is why we train health care providers. And so the Constitution talked about trained health professionals. And Parliament, in its wisdom, clarified who trained health professionals are. Doctors, nurses, midwives, clinical officers. And the Ministry of Health in 2012 then developed standards and guidelines to manage the process of information service provision and care post uh, service so that there, there exist comprehensive guidelines to one uh, guide one uh, the process of information the determination to terminate a pregnancy and care during termination of pregnancy and post abortion care the assumption or that many people have is that uh, people will just get abortion willy-nilly mm. In and Kenya, like access, no, in Kenya, access to country. abortion has then been left uh, as a, an engagement before the woman and a trained healthcare professional. The healthcare professional is then regulated by the professional body, and the judgment by Justice Nyakundi clearly clarifies that one, it is then for Parliament to ensure that we have in place a law and a public policy that guides the process of accessing uh, reproductive health care services, including uh, abortion, within the Constitution. Why is it that we don't have a contention when it comes to maternal health care, mm -hmm. I mean uh, antenatal, postnatal care? Mm -hmm. It is because we bring our personal prejudices mm -hmm against uh, certain services All right. but who suffers most and i think this is the last point that i need to make that these prejudices affect one poor people who cannot access services for example from private health care providers they ac uh, they affect marginal uh, marginalized women and girls it is the poor it is the marginalized who suffers most these barriers are not for you and me who will walk to a private health care facilities and access care these right. barriers are created for those who are actually seeking care from government facilities right. and that is the pain we need to address uh, okay actually time has really flown on our side here but I, I don't want us to wind up before i take you way back i don't want us to get to um you know this crisis point that we have to uh, be discussing abortion discussing contraceptives for our young people how do we prevent ourselves from getting to that particular point and as part of your closing remarks there is a good initiative that your organization is currently spearheading tunza watoto way to program i don't know whether it carries some sort of uh, hope for us interventions that are proactive that can actually save us as a society from getting to this particular point um, dr Olo. yes thank you very much sorry i 
want to just add on what Martin was saying. <laughs> we don't have time. <laughs> about uh, abortion not being <laughs> yeah. a cosmetic surgery. Yeah. It is not something you choose. You yeah. find yourself in a situation and you have to deal with it. But anyway, just to answer, at the East African Center for Human Rights, we run uh, Tunza Watoto Wetu. And the agenda behind Tunza Watoto Wetu is uh, to really capacity build children and to make available information that they need, even as they go, go through the different development stages, to be able to understand uh, their sexuality and to be able to, um, in case of any violations, be able to raise um, concerns. Because one of the things we see, the society is very closed, parents are very busy with work and not really, uh, not, not having much time to attend to their children, and children are left to their own devices. A lot of children are abused at home, a lot of children are abused by uncles, a lot of children are abused by teachers, by people they know, but they do not know what avenues are available for them to be able to uh, make reports or even go to go to uh, yeah, make police reports and go to the uh, go to healthcare centers for purposes of getting treatment. As such, uh, Tunza Watutuwetu is really a toolkit that uh, is intended to build the capacity of children to understand the various case, uh, various situations they are dealing with and to be able to make um, reports and concerns if at all, about uh, their sexual and re reproductive health rights. And this is uh, also in the context of the rise in uh, the number of teenage pregnancies mm -hmm. that we cannot uh, look the other way. Uh, chi protection of children is at the center of what we do. And so we want to preempt before a pregnancy happens, we will capacity build them and allow them to understand what is happening in their bodies and to also uh, be able to avoid cases of pregnancy. And if there's any threat to that particular child um, perpetrated by a teacher, by a parent, by a relative or who else that uh, is sexual or sexually related, then they are empowered to be able to make complaints at the right time mm, before okay. they are violated. All right. After they are violated, we also lay down a procedure of how they are supposed to report or a complaint to either a, service, a health care service provider or even police station. So because we know that or we believe that when children are empowered, when they, they have the information, they are able to make the change that we seek to, to, to see, we, we want to see because a lot of time they are on their own. We are not with them all the time. But when we empower them, mm. that is the token that we give them to protect themselves. Mm. Yes. Yeah great initiative there. We should have a sit down just to talk about defilement and the process. How to identify, how to know that you're in danger, how to report and what happens post the arrest. Yes. You know, just, just to create awareness and, and help our young people also understand that. Your parting shot, Martin. Uh, thank you very much. I think in parting, uh, from the Center for Reproductive Rights, we have managed to secure for women and girls in this country uh, a few things through the Malindi case. That one, Harassment uh, of service providers for providing abortion care must now be a thing of the past. Uh, women and girls are entitled to seek the care they need from those who are qualified to provide that service without intimidation. And uh, it is then the responsibility of government uh, where there is no clear policy put in place that clear policy where there is no law, put in place clear, uh, mm -hmm. that clear law. But the protection of access to reproductive health care, including abortion in the Constitution, has now been upheld. Policemen must cease henceforth from harassing both providers and women and girls seeking reproductive health care in the name of uh, enforcing the law. All right. Thank you so much, Martin Onyango, uh, Senior Legal Advisor at the Centre for Reproductive Rights. I was also having this sit down with Dr. Judith Olo. Uh, she is the Chief Executive Director at the East African Centre for Human Rights, also known as Each Rights. Thank you, both of you, for your time. Of course, it's, uh, it's a conversation much. that yeah. we cannot conclude in one sitting. So looking forward to picking this up in the near future as we talk about how to, um, you know, uh, save our young population. And of course, uh, that is how we wrap it up on News Check. But in just a bit, we'll be having the Swahili version of the program, Tamrini.